So, you know how you got Germans and you got Swamp Germans? Well, Frisians are like the shiny Pokemon version of them. In the next few videos, we will be covering the history of the Dutch province of Friesland. Or West Friesland, for you Germans and Danes watching this, since you have been blessed with other Frisians, you lucky bastard you. Now, after one full Friesland playthrough of Europa Universalis 4, and one education about history that's barely even mentioned Friesland, I feel qualified enough to be an intellectual bastion and to teach my two subscribers about the entire history of our glorious people. Instead of, you know, leaving it to the professionals. Before we can talk about the history of Friesland, we'll have to go over how the landscape looked. And because Frisians used to be spread all over the modern day Netherlands, the first few videos will basically touch on some Dutch history as well. Also, I can't stress this enough, but I will be breezing through this part. Okay, here we go. Like most places in Northern Europe, from roughly 113,000 to 9700 BC, Friesland was covered by a thick layer of ice. Now, of course, the area that became known as the Netherlands didn't look quite like this without any of our beautiful dikes and boulders and dams. So let's remove those first. And of course our coasts have been heavily influenced by the currents of the mighty North Sea. So let's fix that as well. This is roughly what the Dutch coast looked like after the last ice age. When the ice finally buggered off, it had left a rolling slopey landscape in Gaasterland. Which is uncharacteristic for Friesland, since the rest of Friesland is as flat as flat can be. But when I say slopes, Imagine heavy air quotes. This is the Netherlands after all. The ice also left behind peat, which is better known here as turf. The rest of Proto-Friesland was soon covered in clay, left behind by numerous rivers and floodings. At around 11,000 BC, the first people roamed the countryside. These people are known to us as the reindeer hunters. That's it, that's all I have to tell about them. They were hunters. They hunted reindeer. What more could I tell about them? All right, they hunted more than just reindeer. They also hunted bisons, birds, smaller game, and even the mighty mammoth. Which is pretty cool if you ask me. Just some guys with basic technology, hunting the biggest animal they've ever seen. Uh, <clears throat> you get the point. They were hunters and gatherers. In roughly 8000 BC, conditions became more suited for semi-permanent habitation. Nomadic tribes tracked around and camped in high places, like hills, away from the water. Archaeologists estimate the people first truly settled here around roughly 4000 BC. The coastline looked roughly like this, but if we also display tidal areas, the coast could be as thick as this. Camps became more permanent settlements, and primarily, women started dabbling in a bit of farming. Men still went out hunting though, for a little bit more variety on the menu. Around roughly 3400 BC, the first real farms arrived in Friesland. They were part of the famous Funnel Beaker culture. The first archaeological evidence of cattle in modern-day Friesland dates cattle farming back to roughly 3000 BC. Though the cattle did not exactly look like the modern-day cow. Cattle farming would go on to become a staple in the Frisian life. Even to this day, the cow remains central in the Frisian economy. The first few people that lived in the region lived on the higher sand-based ground in the southeast. Because the lower clay-based area tended to flood which isn't really recommended if you're relying on farming for your food. The clay left behind in the west was rich in nutrients and had varied vegetation. But there were two problems. First, the ground was too salty thanks to the constantly flooding seawater. And secondly, those floods were still making life rather uncomfortable, as floods tend to do. But by around 1000 BC, a change set in. The water tended to rise less quickly. And as you can see on this map, from admittedly 500 years later, you can see that the fluctuating tidal areas have been driven out further as well. The rain started to wash away the salt from the ground and the glorious clay was ready for real farming. After a while, the people gradually needed more defense against their fiercest enemy, water. So they made their own hills to live on. They built large mounds on which they then built their homesteads, far above the water. These mounds are known in Dutch and Frisian as Terpen. This new type of settlement soon became characteristic for the Frisian landscape. You can see it in the Roman Pliny the Elder's account of Frisia, for example. He states in his natural history, Here a wretched race is found, inhabiting either the more elevated spots of land or else Amenus is artificially constructed, and of a height to which they know by experience that the highest tides will never reach. Here they pitch their cabins. And still to this day, many villages can be seen mighty and proud on the Terp. Speaking of Romans, 
Now we get to the next chapter in Frisian history. In 50 BC, Julius Caesar of Elysia fame had conquered all of Gaul. That is modern-day France for the unenlightened. He had used the tactic of Duida et Imperia, or divide and conquer for non-nerds. This meant that Caesar, of sweet-talking pirates fame, would give local elites a privileged position if they aided him. This meant that the Gallic elites would slowly Romanize. They would dress in Roman clothing, their kids would go to prestigious Roman schools, they would speak Latin, and so on. But this also meant that the tribes that did not subjugate to the Romans would be dealt with harshly. It is called the Gallic Wars, after all. Not the Gallic first day at school or something. Caesar, of the Ides of March fame, his heir Augustus tried a different tactic when dealing with the Germanic tribes. The tactics Julius Caesar used were not going to work in the Germanic regions. The regions were far more sparsely inhabited. And, for example in Frisia, there was often a certain lack of a local elite. Augustus instead would give certain tribes a more privileged position over the others. This way he would create a series of buffer states that would create a more stable and peaceful border. So too did the Romans arrive in what is now known as the Netherlands. In the year 15 BC they built a military camp at Nijmegen, or as the Romans called it, Ulpia Noviomarus Batavorum. They established friendly contact with the Batavians and the Frisians. The Frisians agreed they would pay taxes in the form of cowhides. Back in the day there was no IJsselmeer, nor a Zuiderzee for that matter. There was however a lake where the Zuiderzee would later be found, known as Lake Flevo. The ground was very marshy and wet. In order for the Romans to make a more permanent presence around the Frisians, they built military camps. One of them will become important later, Castellum Flevum. The exact location is unknown. Groningen, Castricum and Grebbe have all been mentioned as possible locations. However, the fort is assumed to be located at Velsen. Here, remnants of a Roman fort have been found, which could well be the remnants of Castellum Flevum. Now would be a fine moment to talk about which Germanic tribes lived in the region. To the east of the modern-day Netherlands, between the Ames and Elbe River, there were the Kaki. According to some historians, the reason the Frisians were so accepting of the Romans was because in their eyes, the Kaki were a common enemy for the Frisians and the Romans. In the central Netherlands, on the Rhine Delta, there were the aforementioned Batavians. Finally, along the coastal regions, there lived the mighty Frisii. The name Frisii is thought to come from the Proto-Germanic word Frisas, which means curly or curly-haired. There were also some other tribes, but since they are less important to this story, they will go unmentioned. There is also a bit of confusion thanks to Pliny the Elder, as he talks about both Frisii and Frisia Bonis, but there is not a lot known about their differences. Thus, as with every problem in my life, I will ignore them. Allow me to get a little sidetracked here. You may have noticed how I switched from talking about the Frisians to the Frisii. The Frisii are considered to be the traditional ancestors of the Frisians, however, chances are that this is not true. I am going to skip ahead a little bit in this part, but during the Great Migration period, most Frisii left their homes and Frisia became depopulated. Mind you, not everyone left, but a significant number did. This hole was likely filled up by Angles and Saxons. They, confusingly, took over the old name and called themselves Frisians. These settlers are most likely the real ancestors of the modern day Frisians. So from now on, the ancient Frisians will be called the Frisii to avoid confusion. Okay, tangent over. This strapping young man is Nero Claudius Drusus. He is the stepson to Augustus himself and an absolute chad. He was incredibly popular and Augustus considered him to be one of his most competent commanders. This is exemplified by the fact that he managed to establish friendly relations with local tribes in Germania, built a canal that's presumed to still be around, and he laid the foundations for the aforementioned city of Nijmegen. Among the other peoples in the Dutch parts of Germania, he managed to make the Frisii a tributary state to the Romans. He died unexpectedly at the age of 29, when he fell off a horse in 9 BC. He did get a pretty sweet monument out of it though, or well, what's left of it. Although Augustus' policy had success at first, this quickly turned on its head. In the year 9, when the Germans under the leading of Arminius beat Varus' legions at the Teutoburg Forest. And soon, it was time for the Frisii to have their own Teutoburg Forest. Remember how I said the Frisii agreed to pay taxes in the form of cowhides? Well, now it's time to meet this guy. He is the centurion who acts as the Roman governor for the Frisii. He thought the cowhides that the Romans received as tax were too small. See, according to Pliny, the Frisii their cows were smaller but were present in greater numbers. Therefore, Olenius demanded that the Frisii pay their taxes in oxhides. Problem was though, oxhides were valuable. So, like any good natured person, the Frisii formed an orderly line to complain. Just kidding, the crucified tax collectors. Now, to be fair, it has been suggested that when the Frisians couldn't pay their taxes, the Romans took their wives and children to be sold as slaves. 
but this can also simply be slander. So in 28 AC, the Frisi rose up in arms. The Roman garrison was quickly cornered in Castellum Flevum. From their fort, they called for help. The Frisi then put the fort under siege. Now, one thing the Romans hadn't yet learned in the 17 years since Stodeberg Forest is that lightly armed locals know the area better than an invader does and will use this as an advantage. So when a relief force of Aprononius showed up, they were bottled up in a marshy grove called the Badu Henna Wood. Here the Frisi descended upon the Roman legions when the bloody business of the day had concluded. The Frisi had won and 900 Romans lay dead. According to Tacitus, another 400 Romans would kill each other shortly thereafter. As you can see in this quote, they were afraid of being betrayed. There is nothing known about the losses on the Frisii their side. After the Romans got temporarily Vietnam out of Friesland, the Frisii amassed great amounts of prestige. Tacitus noted that the Frisii were now famous among the Germans. Quote, the Frisian name thus became famous in Germany. This was not the last uprising of the Frisii, but it would be the most successful one. Or if you believe Tacitus, it would be the only successful one. In the year 47, the Frisii became subjected to the Romans again. In order to fully subjugate the Frisii, the Romans were planning on making a Roman capital in the Frisian lands. In that same year, however, Emperor Claudius decided that the Rhine would form the Roman border, and the Frisii remained under Roman influence instead of direct rule. The Frisii would never be as successful in revolting as they were in 28 AC, yet the Frisii would rise up against the Romans every now and then, even joining the failed Batavian revolt of Julius Civilis. The revolt ended in disaster. This left what is now known as the Netherlands split in three regions. The southern part was directly under Roman control. The central parts were heavily influenced by Roman culture and the northern parts that only experienced light influence. Here is one pretty famous anecdote about two Frisi, Veritas and Malorix. After the Frisian revolt of 28 and the subsequent resubjugation in 47, the borders between the Romans and the Frisians were set in stone. In the year 58, however, a group of Frisi decided to settle on the Rhine banks in Roman territory. This created a dispute, as you do, and these two boys were chosen to request an audience with the emperor, allegedly burned down a city to build a palace, Nero, and set off to travel to Rome. When they arrived in Rome, the emperor was busy emperoring, so they were given a tour to show off Rome's amazingness. When they arrived in the theater of Pompey, they were shown a play, but being Germanic tribesmen, they did not speak Latin and didn't understand a word of the play. They then spotted a seating area filled with foreign looking men and asked, who are they? To which the tour guide replied, those are envoys from those nations which were distinguished for their bravery and their friendship to Rome. The two mad lads then stood up and said, no one exceeds the Germans in bravery nor loyalty. They then proceeded to walk to the seats and sit down with those envoys. The crowd and Nero loved this display so much that Nero rewarded them with Roman citizenship, which was still pretty rare in those days. In order to fact that Nero still ordered them to abandon the Rhine banks, and when they refused, they were forcibly driven off. This story is one of the earliest examples of Frisian stubbornness, bluntness, and pride that we Frisians and Dutch are still famous for. During the Great Migration period, Frisia became depopulated. The Panagirici Latini says that the Romans forced the Frisii to resettle in other parts of the Roman Empire, likely Britain, according to archaeological evidence. It is still uncertain if it became completely empty or not, but what is certain is that from the year 400 onwards, more people returned to live here. As mentioned before, these people came to call themselves Frisians. Linguistic and archaeological evidence suggests they were primarily Anglo-Saxon settlers. Whether they were the original Frisi returning or the Anglo-Saxon newcomers, they would become the forefathers of the modern Frisians. If you like what you see, then don't forget to press the subscribe button and click the bell icon to get notified when I upload the next video. And have a good one. See you next time.